All right, guys, welcome to another episode. I know it's been a while. There's been a lot going on in in our business. There's been a lot going on in uh, in our personal life. So the podcast took a little bit of a backseat, but I'm going to keep bringing up the podcast. I'm going to keep putting up episodes. Um, there's still going to be more content. It's just that there is there is a lot of things that do happen during a day-to-day uh, business management and operation. And obviously, personal life sometimes does get busy. You guys know this. Uh, most of you, or maybe not most of you, but a lot of you guys are business owners. A lot of you guys run your own dog training business. And even if you don't run your own dog training business, uh, most of you guys, I would say even all of you guys, or the majority of you guys are dog trainers. And whether you train for yourself or you train for somebody else, you know, dogs need to, you know, dogs need to be trained, they need to be taken care of, and that ends up eating a big chunk of your time. So you understand that sometimes the the episodes have a little bit of a gap, but again, the episodes, the content is going to keep coming out. There might be a little bit of wait time here and there, uh, but we're going to keep doing this. So today's episode, I wanted to focus on one of the recent experiences that I had as of the making of this episode. It was a recent experience, a couple, a few weeks ago, uh, which was my attendance to the Nepopo Silver School. And I wanted to do a bit of a review and give you a little bit of my perspective from two different angles. My perspective from the outsider's perspective before I went to school, you know, sort of what what I, the little I knew about the, the system, the little I knew about the, you know, the, uh, the whole uh, Nepopo mentality, and, and then my perspective as a student, because, you know, it is, it is different. You know, you see the, you see the Nepopo uh, students and the, and the, uh, the Nepopo trainers, and you see the seminars from the outside, you see the announcements, you see the trademark uh, on, the, on the Nepopo name, and it does create a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of an exclusive feel to it, where you look at it from the outside and you go, what are these people doing? <laughs> right, so... I know that was my experience and um and from an outsider. Okay, that was my experience from an outsider's perspective. That was how it looked. And a lot of what was done, a lot of the what the Napopo trainers did, I remember thinking to myself, well, it's not a whole lot different than what a lot of people already do, right? Now you do give, you know, Depending on on your experience level, you know what you see some the popo students do might seem very very different, or it might seem very very familiar. So in my case, it just seemed very familiar, but there was still some sort of, uh, some sort of behind the curtains, uh, type of uh, look to it. Like there was like some sort of veil that just covered the the Nepopo students, right? And uh, the whole Nepopo training system. So it does have uh, that um, that feel to it, that exclusiveness feel to it, whether it was, you know, by design or whether it was a byproduct of the system, who knows? Right, but uh, this is my perspective. Again, this is only my perspective. Somebody else might have a completely different perspective. Other uh, Nepopo students obviously might have a, an entirely different perspective uh, than that of which I had prior to going to school, and that's sort of you know how it was for me. But I was really excited about the opportunity to go because I'll I'll tell you a little bit of. Of history on um, on how I I found out about Bart Ballone. So Bart and Michael um, have this very 
you know, very successful movement, right? Nepopo, it's a very successful movement, very successful school, and um, and, and there there is now a a growing, um, it seems to be like a growing uh, growing movement. I mean, for, I guess for lack of better words, where you are more and more fam- familiar with the term, even if you're not part of it, even if you're not part of that, uh, of the school, or right? if you're, even if you're not a graduate, you hear Nepopo, and Nepopo is becoming more and more of a household term. So how I first found out about, you know, Bart, it was years ago, years ago. I mean, it was probably back in 2000, um, maybe 10, 2010, 2011, something like that. And it was while I was in Afghanistan. I was in Afghanistan. I was working with the contract working dogs. And I always looked up and I, I was always reading stuff on on dogs. All right, so I, I always, on, my, on the little free time I had, I was watching videos. I was reading books. Um, so I was really, really um, invested in the whole dog training thing. I wanted to keep getting better constantly. You know, I, I read um, and saw a bunch of material on on different dog trainers, right? Ivan Balabanov was one of them. And then I came across this video uh, of Thor. So it was around that time. I, don't, I mean, I don't remember when he made the video. I don't remember exactly when I when I saw that video, but I saw that video. It's a very famous video. A lot of people are very familiar with, with the video. It's a video of Bart uh, Balone doing a training session with with Thor. I believe that's a dog's name, the Bicolor Malinois. So the training session obviously looks very impeccable, looks looks very crisp, very precise, and the dog looked powerful. The dog looked very powerful during the entire training session. And um dog looked just precise, but it but he looked powerful. And that made such an impact on me. You know, I'm I'm s I was so used to up to that point, I was so used to the the handler or the trainer having to, you know, pump up the dog, even a working dog, right? This it wasn't uncommon. It's still not uncommon to see the trainer kind of, you know, try to pump up a dog, which with a very low drive dog, I can understand that. Your average your average pet dog, I completely understand that. But when you have a a working dog that already has the drive and the desire to do everything. And you see the handler, you know, kind of going all crazy. And it, from the very beginning of my exposure to working dogs, I always thought that in the back of my head. I always wonder that because one of the big things with working dogs, if you've gone to a handler school, okay, if you've gone to a, to a dog handler school, whether it's single purpose or dual purpose, um, or if you are, you know, do, going through a trainer's course, one of the things that is really drilled into you is you have to praise your dog. You have to like get him super pumped, right? Bit staple handling maneuver from American dog handlers. The dog does the right behavior. You pay the dog, and when you pay the dog, you party. You go woo. You get super super pumped. If you watch. Any mil- military working dog handler or police dog handler, you'll see this. The dog will, you know, do the exercise, will alert. The dog receives the Kong or the pipe, whatever reward it's getting. And as soon as the dog gets paid, the handler goes, woo hoo 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 like big, big party, right? And the reason that happens is it is drilled into you, drilled. I remember going to handler school, going to, uh, dog trainer school for working dogs and it was drilled like like you know the dog had its got its toy got paid and then if you didn't if you didn't uh, praise the dog uh, with enough exuberance you would get yelled at <laughs> the, the the trainer the, the person watching the conducting the training if you were handling and you rewarded the dog and you know you didn't like praise the dog enough 
it was like, what are you doing? You need to praise the dog more. Come on, come on, come on. You got to praise the dog more. And I remember, too, working for this other company, uh, not at the dog training school that I went to, but once I was working for this other company, I remember handling the dog, right? And the owner, right? The owner of the of the business, as I was handling the dog for protection, and the decoy was, you know, agitating the dog. If the dog wasn't pumped enough, like it was my responsibility as the handler to pump the dog up, like by praising, slapping him, doing all kinds of crazy things. And I remember, like it was dr- again, it was drilled. If you've worked with working dogs, if you've been a handler, you understand what I'm talking about. Like, it is frowned upon to just stand there. Like, your dog gets paid, you got to, like, party with the dog, right? So I remember as a handler, sometimes even for bite work, like, if the if the decoy couldn't pump up the dog enough, it was like, you know, they all looked at me as a handler. Like, it was my responsibility to pump the dog up to get excited about the decoy. And none of that, deep down, made sense to me. Like very early in my career, when I had very low experience, very little experience, I remember thinking to myself, why do I have to pump the do- a working dog up? It's a working dog. It's been selected for drive. Why is it my responsibility to get the dog excited about playing with the toy or about getting pumped about the decoy? It never made sense to me on a deep, deep level. And I always brushed it off as, well, you know, I'm new. You know, what do I know? These people have been doing it for 20 years. Why, you know, why do I, you know, obviously they've thought about this. So this has to make sense. But it didn't make sense. Deep down, it was like a little nagging voice. And then I saw that video of Bart. And he's so just, you know, he's, he's, you can see all the power and all the excitement is coming from the dog. And Bart is directing. He is also rewarding. But the entire time, it was such a nice um, performance where you see the handler uh, respond to the dog. And the dog is doing all the All the excitement is coming from the dog. And I thought, okay, there is something he's doing that is that is making this dog super pumped, right? And, uh, and it makes sense. It's a working dog. And when I saw that video, what I did is I thought to myself, I have to apply this. I don't know, right? I mean, I, I, at this point in my career, I still didn't have as much experience. I was accumulating the experience, but not a whole lot, right? So I thought to myself, I have to replicate that. I have to replicate that with every dog that I work with. I have to work towards that. All right, so what I did is I just went on a quest to watching every piece of content where Bart Belong was in it. I mean, I, wa- I I searched on the internet, on YouTube, I put Bart Belong, just a- every single, even if it was like a like a, a short, short video, I went through every single one of those videos. If it was short clips where Bart was talking about something, I was there watching it. I was taking notes. And um, and everything he said made perfect sense. I started to apply everything that that I was hearing him say in the videos, on uh, you know on on my approach to training. And I remember there was this one very long video, and I believe it was in Russia, where Bart is doing a seminar in a in a sort of a classroom. There's a lot of people there, and. It was kind of difficult, not difficult to listen to it, but, um, you know, Bart was talking in English and he had a, a translator, right? Translator translate what Bart was saying sentence by sentence to the crowd. And it was just going back and forth. So it wasn't like a fluid Bart was talking the entire time. It was like Bart was talking. He had to pause. The translator had to translate. And that went on for like over an hour, I believe. It's something that, you know, people will go, oh, man, that, that seems like a pain. I'm not going to watch that. But I wa- and I not only watched it, but I watched it like several times, taking notes, listening to it, listening to everything. I was like, this makes perfect sense. So the whole, you know, the whole product of his system just looked 
impressive and it looked just looked very nice right and then i would see other trainers you know do all kinds of crazy things dance and move and like you know do all these crazy maneuvers where they had to be a lot of skill not like skill as a trainer but skill movement wise from the handler from the trainer where you had to like dodge the tug back and forth give the dog the toy which you know again i subscribe to that still to a degree but it's like the trainer in the other systems the trainer had to develop this dancing skill and and you know in in all the videos i saw of bart i never saw bart dance you know quote unquote dance it was like training session the dog will do all the dancing right the dog will do all the training all the movement all the power came from the dog bart would just direct mark right clicker uh or or with this with this release um sound that he that he makes right and the dog would just you know release and be all powerful and uh, and that to me was very intriguing very very impressive so again i just kept looking i just kept you know watching all these videos re-watching all these videos and i always had it in the back of my head and every time that i trained when i got my first working dog that was my aim it was like i want to look like that right i want to do my best if i can own if i can look about you know 10 percent of the way you know he looks with when he's running his dog then then i'm doing good right and i'm not uh you know i'm i wasn't a fanboy I, none of that right it wasn't like oh you know he, he's he's my idol and, and and you know like i'm in love with bar it was nothing like that it's just the product itself sp speaks the product speaks for itself the product is such a good advertisement of the system so then then i started to see nepopo right then i started to see that coming into the market nepopo it became more and more popular and i was like oh cool that looks pretty cool and um <clears throat> so i was like, okay now now i need to look into this and then i started seeing people that were so i, I was kind of watching this sort of evolve right so then i saw some of the nepopo people talk about nepopo and um and i was like oh, okay cool but then again from the outsider's perspective it seemed very exclusive and i remember seeing some of the some of the videos made by some gold graduates where they would talk about this this and that and i was like oh, okay yeah they're talking about the quadrant something i'm very familiar with positive reinforcement negative reinforcement negative punishment positive punishment right classical and operant conditioning this is stuff that i'm very familiar with because i've taught it for several years when I was an instructor at Starmark, right, that was one of the things that I taught. So I had to do a lot of research and a lot of reading, a lot of attending seminars myself, and uh, you know, and, and reading complex literature so that I could fully understand it, so that I could teach it. So this was all stuff that I, it was making sense to me. I was like, okay, this makes perfect sense. What these people are talking about makes sense, uh, but but their language, the students' language, it seemed like it was almost a little bit fanatical and I'm not the only one who feels that way. Okay. There are other people that I've talked to other friends that I've talked to that would have the same perspective. Like, Oh man, like it seems like they're a little bit fanatical, right? Like, like they're like subscribing to this, like with a little bit of fanatism. So I'm like, okay, if that's even a word. So I was like, okay, well, well it makes sense. I mean, the guy clearly knows, you know, the system, again, the system clearly speaks for it, for itself. So I understand, right? I mean, the quadrants are the quadrants. It makes perfect sense. Classical conditioning, upper conditioning makes perfect sense. You know, um, the application of all of that, obviously, it's, it's sort of uh, unique to your own style. How you apply positive reinforcement, how you apply negative reinforcement, how you apply positive and negative punishment, that is also a little bit, indicative of your personality and a little bit indicative of your experience how you apply positive reinforcement and how i apply positive reinforcement might be different you know your interpretation and your application of positive reinforcement might be you know one piece of kibble my application of positive reinforcement might be one piece of kibble now a uh, piece of hot dog later a piece of chicken breast another rep five pieces of chicken breast, the next rep, big jackpot, and, you know, 10 reps. So 
there's still positive reinforcement, but the application is different. And that's sort of, it was so always my approach to make it like that. And this is all came from, you know, from experience, from listening to very experienced people and from watching a lot of content from Barbellone, right? So I thought to myself, okay, well, you know, obviously they, they are very, uh, they're very uh, um, almost, almost religious, right? In their, in their uh, belief in the system. It makes sense. I get it. It makes sense to me. So uh, that, that was the one thing that I thought to myself, why, why are these people like that? But, um, but anyway, so I had the opportunity, I went and I remember thinking when I went, as I was driving there, I remember thinking, oh, I'm excited, right? I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. I'm going to get to learn from the guy, you know, and his wife from them themselves, right? I've been watching the videos, been watching the content, and now I get to sit in the classroom where this person and his wife, right, the the people that have really inspired me to to be better every time. Now, now I'm sitting at, now I have a, a seat at the table. Now I'm there where I am listening. I am part of the crowd. I am the one learning. I'm taking notes. So I was super pumped about it. And, um, and the other part of me was also thinking, I wonder what it is that makes some of some of these people a little bit religious. I'm gonna keep an eye out for that too. So I went, and um, I gotta tell you, my experience was pretty pretty awesome. But I have um, you know, every time I go to a seminar, every time I go to any continued education program, I always just completely open my mind. I've I've been to two two formal doctrining schools, and when I went to the second doctrining school years ago, I was willing to unlearn what I had learned previous, and I was willing to absorb everything my instructors told me when I went to Triple Crown, now Starmark, and I learned so much because I was able to completely look at this new information with. You know, without the without the the filters, without the goggles, but completely new. And then I was able to afterwards combine what I had previously learned and what I had now learned without any filters. And now now I had a system, right? And my experience with the working dogs, coupled with my experience with the pet dogs and what I learned at, at Starmark, really. Uh, really, um, really gave me the edge because again, I, I wasn't. I've worked with people, especially as an instructor, where students would come to Starmark with experience, but everything they learned, they had to filter it through their experience, and you could see the struggle there. So I, I was never like that. I was always like, I'm going to get rid of the filters and I'm going to absorb everything. Okay. Later, I'll decide what I keep and what I don't keep. But I'm going to absorb everything. I'm not going to look at anything through any goggles, and I'm going to get rid of the filters. I'm going to take it all in, and then afterwards, I will combine. And then afterwards, I will pick out certain things that I really love about the system, and I'm going to maybe uh, put some things to the side. So when I went to Napopo Silver, I did the same exact thing. I was pumped. I was super excited. And I was just taking notes the entire time that they were talking, right? I was taking notes. Also, prior to Silver, uh, there is homework. You know, you have the the books that, that they tell you that is mandatory reading before you go to the school is The Talent Code uh, and Don't Shoot the Dog. So I had read The Talent Code before. Uh, Don't Shoot the Dog. I had started reading it before, but I completely thoroughly finished it. I can give you a review on Don't Shoot the Dog. It's very interesting read. Um, but anyway, that's a maybe a topic for a different episode. But they, the other homework that they had is to watch a film, uh, an old film, um, on um, you know on Helen Keller and and her caretaker, and another film on um, on on Buck, which is a um, I believe his name, Buck. Yeah. 
um, a, a horse trainer. So I did all of that. I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely going to do it. I definitely have got to do it. And I'm reading it, but I'm also reading this stuff and I'm taking notes. And I'm like reading it. When I get to the hotel, I'm reading it the day, the night before because I'm taking this really serious. And I'm thinking, crap, maybe there's going to be a test on it, right, whatever. I go there. Um, and, I mean, the books did come up a couple of times. Uh, so it was definitely helpful to uh, to have that fresh in your mind. Uh, but I will tell you, you know, I will say going to silver school with the prior experience, the prior knowledge that I already had about classical operant conditioning, the quadrants, and, uh, you know, with doctrining experience, I believe that's what helped me get the most out of it. I do remember, um, I mean, this is this is a review, okay? So uh, it is going to uh you know maybe resonate with some of you or and maybe it won't but um i do remember having some classmates during the school that were a little bit lost okay where i mean it's it's a week of theory and it's a very difficult week there are tests every day they're randomly picking people out and go go to the front of the class now talk about this so it was a it was a week where it it was a lot more intense than I than I anticipated. So it was it was awesome. It was it was just really really good. Um, but I do remember having some classmates during that week that you know were a little bit lost because this is all information that took me years to get comfortable with and to learn thoroughly. And there were some people that I remember them even telling me on the breaks, yeah, you know, I, I don't know anything about you know this positive this positive that negative this negative that this is all brand new to me and they did well i mean they they passed but they sort of had to rely on on a little bit of memorization memorization they had to rely a little bit on uh i need to study and remember this information for the test now that is where i do see you know maybe a little bit of what i saw from my outside perspective was you know, people were um, a little bit, a little bit, uh, not fanatic. Maybe fanatic is a strong word. Maybe a little bit, um, you know, very, very pumped about the system. But maybe it was because, maybe, okay, this is a maybe. I don't know. This, again, you may or may not agree with this. But maybe the reason that I, I concluded that maybe the reason that some Napopo students are very uh like oh like almost fanatic about it. Maybe it's because the information is so unique and so great that um that in order to pass because you have to pass the school. You you don't just attend and go, here, good luck, right? This is this is a great having you. You have to pass the test. You have to take tests every day and then at the the end of the week there's a final written test. You have to pass with a ninety. 90 is the minimum minimum score. So I thought I concluded that maybe maybe the reason there's a little bit of um, you know where some students go, yeah, yeah, we have to do it that way. It's maybe because they had to sort of memorize the application. I might be wrong. Okay, maybe they're just really excited about the system, which is fine. But I thought to myself, if I didn't have the experience and the knowledge that I have attending the school and I was like and this was like one of my first schools with very little practical experience in dog training what I would do is I would memorize everything and now once I memorize to be successful in the program to be successful in, in that week and and then maybe what I would also do afterwards is I would probably you know, go off of the memorized information that I had and anything that didn't fit what I memorized would seem wrong because I relied on some memorization. And because I had to memorize some of it, because I had to memorize some of it, then, you know, again, I have to go, I have to stick to this because this is how I remembered it for that test. And then as the years went by and my experience expanded, then it would start to make 
much, much more sense past the memorization. Bart and Michael did say something along those lines. I'm not going to put words in their mouth, uh, but I know for sure that was that was articulated by them okay, on more than one occasion. I remember towards the beginning of the week, Bart said something along the lines of, we understand this is a lot of information, and we understand that once you go home Friday, right, you're going to be like, oh, my God, like, this is so much. I, I, I don't really even know if, if, uh, if I remember everything that I learned. But this is what he told us. But as the years go by, what will happen is this will start to make sense. It will start to come together as the years go by. And that's the same conclusion I made. It, it makes perfect sense because Barton himself said this. You know, he said he he did give us some anecdotes of of his youth and some of the coaches, some of the people that he had when he was, you know, that that were that were mentoring mentored him uh, when he was young. Some of the lessons that he saw early on when he was young, just a young young boy, right, uh, and a young trainer where he had mentors that would tell him this is you know this is why we do this or where we had where he had um when he had insights himself where he was like okay you know I I noticed that this happens when I do it this way but then what happened was at the time he talks about this that during during that time it didn't really make sense to him but then years later years years later he connected the dots and he was like that's why you know, my mentor did it that way, right? That's why that makes perfect sense. So they're both very aware that that's what happens with the learning process. You get information, you have to remember it, right? And then as you gain the experience, you look back and you go, that makes perfect sense. This is why I'm doing it that way. So... Again, this is sort of my perspective as to why maybe it seems, at least to the outsiders. Again, the reason I wanted to explain and break that down to it, it it's not just to point fingers at the people that are very, very, um, you know, very into Nepopo, right? I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, wow, those people are fanatics, they're religious fanatics. Um, but to give them actually the... Uh, sort of a um to let people know this is why you know this is why they're like that because the system is freaking awesome and now i'm going to tell you about the stuff that i learned obviously you know i'm not going to condense everything i've learned in those you know in that week but here's the gist of the um you know the of that week dogs do a lot of things on their own with heart and soul. Okay, and dogs will do things on their own with heart and soul that you don't even ask them to do. You don't ask them to do it. They'll do it on their own. There are things that dogs do by themselves without you asking them to do it with heart and soul. Not only will they do it with heart and soul, but they will fight for those things. They will fight for those behaviors. Right, like you know, one example that they gave is, you know, you see dogs, right? You you'll see a dog that will put his nose to the ground, and will start, you know, just tracking, right? Just sniffing with with a lot of intensity, with a lot of power, and um, and that same dog, you will even try to pull him away, and he will not. He like it lock up, and he'll keep his nose to the ground. And some dogs, you'll even correct them to like, pull them away from the ground and they'll still keep fighting you for it. That same dog, at a different time in the day, when you ask him to track because you're working for you know something in regards to tracking, that same dog will act like tracking is the most boring thing in the world, will not track for you. And why is it then that that same dog moments earlier was so passionate about tracking but then when you do it with them they're not uh, this is you know not a rhetorical question for the listener to go well you know obviously you know you're looking at tracking human and then you got 
they could have been tracking wildlife. Obviously, the wildlife is more important. We're not talking about those little reasons. We're talking about the dog doing that behavior, okay, with a lot of intensity on their own, with a lot of power, tail up, super pumped. But when you do a track, it, it's like you're having to like do all these kinds of crazy things for the dog to even mildly look interested in tracking. Same thing with a retrieve, right? How many times do you see a dog? This, these are just little examples that they'll grab anything. Like they'll just grab some random stick, a, a branch that even that, that's not even smooth. It's got like it's got like jagged edges and everything. Dog will grab it with a lot of intensity and just have a nice full um, stronghold on it, and they'll even bring it to you for you to throw it. But then that same dog, when you try to work on a retrieve, they act like putting anything in their mouth is disgusting. And there are so many examples like that where a dog on his own will tell you, I want to do this with a lot of power. But when you tell them to do, when you teach them to do those things, when you quote unquote teach them to do those things, they go, I don't know what what you're talking about. I don't know what to do. Again, it's not a rhetorical. If you're an anti-Nipopo person, uh, you're probably thinking, oh, well, that's simple because that's not for you, okay? If you are very anti-Barbalon, if you're very anti-Nipopo, um, yeah, this is not going to make sense. You're just going to find a bunch of holes because that's the perspective you already have listening to this. But if you open up and you really think about those things, right? There are a lot of things that dogs do spontaneously on their own with a lot of power. But why, why is it that when we step in and we go, okay, we're going to show you how to do something that you already know how to do, they go, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't. And if I do know how to do it, I'm not going to give you any power. And and here is the the short of the long, right? This is the the bit of the conclusion as to why that happens. Dogs, when it's their idea, when it's their idea, when it's their creation, when it's their behavior that they figure out for themselves. It's more important than when it's your idea. If it's their idea, they're more powerful. Not only are they more powerful for it, they will fight you for it. They'll go, no, I I have to do this. Just like the dog. Like you tell the dog, hey, to drop that stick. Dog will not drop the stick. <laughs> right? Like, hey, dude, get get off that get you know, get your nose off the ground nose off the ground. We're gonna do something else. Dog goes, No, 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 I wanna keep my nose on the ground. Then later it's like you have to fight him to put their nose on the ground. Another example, and I and I experienced this myself with some of my club members. Like some dogs, like will will try to work on them barking, and their bark is like, you know, very like weak, right? And it's like these dogs don't even know how to bark. And you're like, okay, dude, let, let's do this, you know, let's do this, okay, bark, and and a lot of times it works with our, our our techniques, but then you have some dogs that it's a little bit of a struggle. They're like. Yeah, they like give you this baby bark like they're learning how to talk. <laughs> but then moments earlier or moments later, that same dog will not shut up. And they give you the most powerful barks. The most intense and powerful barks on their own with heart and soul, with passion. But when you go, okay, dude, uh, let's do a session where you bark. <laughs> they do this really pathetic bark and like you're trying to like get them to bark a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. So that's the whole concept of Nepopo is how do we make these dogs do something with heart and soul is by improving their situation, right? By making it so that so that the uh, the system revolves around th- around them improving their situation about them creating these behaviors and um you know it does seem you know i have thought about it myself and i've talked to a couple of friends you know prior to this where we've talked about this and we go yeah man it's like like the tuition for that for that school seems to be pretty high and then you go it's like it's just five days and you know it's you're not even bringing your dog. But I'm telling you, 
if you just go there with an open mind, you know, with your eyes wide open and your ears wide open and you're ready to take notes and absorb and think about this information, it really is, it really is, um, I would even, I would even say it's definitely a game changer. And yes, the quadrants are the quadrants. Classical conditioning is classical conditioning. Operant conditioning is operant conditioning. Learning theory is the same. But I think of this system and this, you know, this workshop or this seminar or this school as imagine that somebody taught you how to cook and the person that taught you how to cook was a good cook. And, you know, they taught you how to make let's say something simple, right? Like, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe a stew. They tell you how to make a stew and to the average person, like, you know, they go, Hey, make a stew. Then I don't even know where to begin. So I'm just going to have somebody make the stew for me. And you are the person that makes the stew. You learn how to do it. And then through the years of you making that stew, you developed your own style of making your stew and it, tastes delicious it tastes amazing and you have your own way right and it's great the same ingredients right the fundamentals of cooking are the same um temperature ingredients um mixture of ingredients the concept is the same but then you hear about this this uh way of of cooking and you know call it whatever you want it's a system and you hear people going hey you know like have you made a stew this way the you know that this system or the way that this five day seminar tells you how to make a stew and you're like dude it's a stew i mean it's not that complex it's just it's a stew you know it's just the same dish and you're like and the person goes yeah yeah it is but but it just gives you that extra punch on that recipe and you see these people like very very uh enamored with that with that you know stew recipe I'm like, dude, you got to go learn from this chef how to make the stew. And you're like, but my stew already tastes good. A lot of people like it. You go and and you're like, well, crap. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to relearn how to make a stew. And now my recipe that I made stew for years now suddenly doesn't work. It's complete garbage. I don't know how, how, how I feel about that. You go, you sit down and you're half expecting that the recipe is not brand new because it will you know it will tell you your stew was really crap the entire time um but at the same time you you're, you're kind of half expecting also i hope it is different because you know it is a week of my time it is an investment of resources to be here for a week so that i could learn something new and i don't i don't want to learn the same thing so you go there you sit there and the chef goes, all right, guys, here's how we make the stew. And you realize as they're telling you this, they tell you your ingredients are the same. And you're like, oh, okay, what's the same ingredients? And they tell you the utensils are the same. Oh, okay, well, okay, so so far I'm validated in what I've been doing so far. So that that's good. And then they go, here's a slightly different application. And maybe they go, you know, instead of uh, starting the traditional way where you put, where you, you know, where you put the, uh, the, the ingredients here and then you heat it up and then you add the, you know, you add the seasonings. I don't know how to make a stew. I'm just making this up. But if they tell you, they tell you, this is how normally people make a stew. Here is one way that we found out that we found that makes, that gives the stew that extra punch. Same ingredients. Right, same utensils. You don't have to buy any any new utensils. Same utensils, same ingredients. All right, but the order of the ingredients is a little bit different. So if you tweak your recipe a little bit, suddenly it gives that recipe much of a punch. It gives it an extra kick. And you're like, oh, and so that makes sense. If I just change this and this, when I make the stew, it gives it an extra punch. Pfft, that makes perfect sense to me. So what happened is 
you didn't go there and they told you, forget about your stew, your crap, it's complete garbage, these, these are the wrong ingredients, you have to come up with these brand new ingredients, right? It wasn't like that. Now, if, if you're a really incompetent dog trainer, if, you, if you're really bad at making stew, uh, then that might be the case. They might tell you, they might, the information that you get there might be like, oh crap, I've been doing it wrong the entire time. But that wasn't the case when I went there. Like I went there and I was like, wow, it's like this makes so much sense. And now I know why there were some things that I did really well prior, right, that I did really, really well. Um, and I knew that it was predictably, you know, it was consistent. If I did it this way, the dog will give me this performance every time. But when I went here to Napopo Silver, it was like I was told, this is why, this is the reason why predictably you get this result. And now I'm like, that makes that makes sense why that happened that way with all the dogs that I trained. Okay, so there wasn't a whole lot of like unlearning and, and discarding a lot of stuff as much as there, there was more of a, oh, the approach makes sense. So that week was very intellectual. There was there was um a lot of um a lot of talking and teaching on dopamine endorphins. Um there were studies and experiments cited throughout the week. So it wasn't just like uh you know knuckle dragging, here is how you hold a leash, here's how you do this, here's what you do then and you do that and then voila you get this result. It wasn't like that. It was like a very intellectual workshop. All right, that's what I got out of it. So it was very, very intellectual. It was like, this is the reason why that happens. This is the reason why this happens, which we want that to happen. And here's the reason why it looks that way when people do it without realizing it. And like, that makes perfect sense. Like, so... Obviously, I can't go over a whole lot of details, not because, um, not because I'm forbidden to go over over details. It was, it's nothing like that. You know, the other thing too that that uh, seems to be the case with with the Napopo system is it seems secretive. Like people are like, oh, you know, that it's a secret. Like, ah, you know, it, like you you gotta be blessed with the with the gold stamp to know this, this, and that, um, and it's. No, really not because because there's nothing like again, there's no like necessarily like a um you know, this is like the saving uh you know, recipe. But a lot of it just makes perfect sense. The approach is very unique. Okay, I'm gonna say that. The approach is very unique. Bart and Michael didn't come up with like this um completely um you know, un unreal and and God sent way to do things. Uh, it was rather here is an application that is very unique. Here is an application that makes perfect sense. That actually makes sense. It's not like it, it wasn't like um, you just have to trust us. This is this is how we do it, right? This is how uh, Bart and Michael do it, and you just have to do it that way, and and you will have the same results. This is how you have to you have to do it this way, and you have to trust us. You don't have to ask why. You can't ask why. You just have to do it that way, and you always have to teach it that way. And this is the way. That's that's very religious, and they're not like that at all. I think they somehow, um, you know the Napopo system got a little bit of a reputation for being religious. And I know this from my perspective prior to, okay? It has this reputation of being very religious, um, which, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. When you think of religion and you go, well, you know, this is a religious way. Like, the people that are religious about dog training, they're terrible, right? You got systems. I'm not going to name names, but there are systems that uh, they're like, we have to do it this way, period. I know there are systems like that. Okay, there are systems like that where the the people doing the system and the people that do the certifications of those systems 
they tell you, no, 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 you have to do it this way. This is the way he did it 50 years ago. This is the way he wrote it in the books, and this is the way you have to do it. And this is the way it's always worked, and this is the way it's always going to work. And every other system outside of that is not good. That's religious. And that that's bad. In my opinion, that's bad. I found that to I didn't find that to be the case with Napopo. Truly that was not the case with Napopo. There was no um no one of my friends when I told him, Yeah, I'm gonna go to Napopo, all right. Um one of my friends, he's a he's a good friend of mine, somebody I trust, he's a good trainer too. You know, as joking, he said, All right, man, that's cool, I'm excited for you. He's like, Don't drink the Kool Aid. But that was sort of like the joke, right? It was like it was it was a joke, but at the same time, you hear about this from outsiders where, you know, it's the Kool-Aid and it's like it's a religion. But it truly, I'm telling you from my experience as a student, it wasn't the case at all. None in the least. There is nothing religious about the system. It's just a bunch of strategies that make perfect sense. Just make perfect sense. So, um, I mean, and, and I'll even tell you what Bart and Michael said at the end of the week. They told us. They were like, you know, other systems work great. When applied properly, other systems work great. You can be a good dog trainer. And if you use a different system, your dog will look really good. If you're not a good dog trainer, it doesn't matter what system you use. Your dog is not going to look very good. So you have to have the experience, but all their systems work really, really well. And they said, do not criticize all their systems. What religion does that? All their dog training systems do that. I know it. And some of you guys know it. There are all their dog training systems, the so-and-so method of dog training system, right? They'll mock any other system that doesn't fit their book, that doesn't fit their criteria. They straight up do. The purely positive trainers do the same thing. They're like, oh, you know, if you do this, this, and that, you're not a dog trainer. That is super religious. And then you got Bart and Michael going, every other system works great if applied properly. What religion does that? What religious movement uh, would do that? They don't. And so... The purpose of this episode is to to get that, um, you know, at least to the people that listen to this episode, to get that, um, you know, that that weird feel about Nipopo that I know outsiders have. I know this from experience, okay? All right? Like, I didn't go here, get baptized, and, and now I'm like a, a Nipopo preacher. Nothing like that at all. I'm just telling you my experience. And from my experience, from a very you know, very neutral perspective. The system is awesome. It's amazing. You know, Mark, Bart and Michael are awesome teachers and it just makes perfect sense. There truly is nothing religious about it. Uh, they said, you know, every system works great when applied properly. And they told us, do not mock, do not criticize other systems. You don't want to do that. You know, it's perfectly fine. And that was, when they said that, that really, you know, it really made me feel good about this whole thing. I was like, you know, this is freaking awesome. And then I I came out of that, you know, I drove back and I was thinking, I don't get why some people are so religious and, and weird about this. Doesn't make sense. Because from my experience that week and from listening to Bart and Michael talking about different systems, I got nothing about that, right? There, there was nothing, there was nothing fanatic about their approach or anything they said. So anyway, I just wanted to make an episode on that. Uh, it was a great experience, and I'm already applying what I learned that week. I'm already applying the the Napopo system to my personal dogs. I'm already applying it to my clients' dogs. And we are starting to see power. 
I can tell you this, okay? I'm starting to see power. I'm starting to see that that uh, that strength, that uh, that excitement, by just applying some of the things that I learned during that week. So it was definitely worth it. Uh, I'm glad I went, and they did say it was their last. But um, you know, there are other students that are going to be doing more seminars. So I suggest that if you get the opportunity to learn, learn the system.